Can y'all hear me? Good. Good to see you, Debbie. Got a picture of one of your bulls going to come up. I could talk for two hours about how good her genetics are. But I'll give you a little of my background. I learned to feed cattle on a dairy farm. My granddaddy was a dairy farmer. He'd done a lot of grazing. You know, a dairy cow is going to tell you how good her breakfast was at supper time. You know, it's a perfect feed tester. She, she's going to let you know how good you're taking care of her. If you're trying to get performance in cattle, you've got to have that mindset. You've got to think about, I've got to feed them good if I'm going to get performance. We heard about three pounds a day gain. You can beat that on, on forage at certain times of the year. But uh, <clears throat> we do a lot of, of fire-cured tobacco. The tobacco ground on my farm goes back into forage production. Consequently, I use annuals, summer annuals, bring out winter annuals. And, and we graze them, and we make silage out of them, and we make hay out of them. But uh, we started selling direct market into the public in 2011, and it was an accident. Prior to that, I was just doing cow-calf. Granddaddy quit dairy farming in the late 80s, early 90s, and I graduated high school, and I put a beef herd on the farm. And I saw no point in spending my money down at the feed store buying commodities. You know, I can grow good enough for it, so I don't have to spend my money. They don't need my money. They can get that from somebody else. So I've never bought commodities. I raised cow calves, sold the calves, and roll cropped a little and raised, raised tobacco. And uh, I kind of made a fool out of myself with one of my older neighbors one day. They were talking about feeding hay. And I said, well, I got through last winter on two bales per cow. He looked at me and he said, that's impossible. I don't believe it. And I didn't tell nobody that no more. I thought, well, you know, if they're going to think I'm being braggadocious or lying, I'm just not going to tell them that. But, you know, we stockpiled our fescue and we managed our grass and we grazed till the first of the year and we fed hay for two months. Two, two bales per head. You know, they didn't have no calves on them at the time. They was easy to maintain. But uh, that, that's sort of where I'm coming from and my mindset has always been towards letting the cow do the harvesting. We've already heard that, to let the cow be the combine. But in the uh, spring, I'm typically grazing. That's Marshall ryegrass. That would be about mid to late April. Mm, several times I've weighed cattle going in on Marshall and weighed them coming off and typically average three and a half pounds for 60 days. You can get an average of three to three and a half pounds. That means you've got some of them out there that would weigh four. Some that don't hardly come up to the bark. That's not a picture of summer forage. I don't, my wife put this together. I said, well, them are in the pond. Now, we was doing, <laughs> there ain't no summer forage, but there will be a picture of some of my summer forage. We have been doing a Sudex and rotating it. We started out rotating it with a, Alfalfa, grazing alfalfa. I put in some gra grazing variety of alfalfa, and we done real good with that. We had the sudex below. You saw that field below the alfalfa. We strip grazed the alfalfa. We put them on the alfalfa when it was dry, moved them off on the sudex at night or when the dew was on, and uh, <clears throat> you know you just it was all irrigated ground. Of course, this is tobacco farm. It's, it's all irrigated ground. Anything that's not in continuous fescue. And, uh, you know, we, we always had forage. I always had something for them to eat. My fall idea, I put my cattle on the feedlot usually in September. If I, and if, if I don't have enough annuals to go around, I feed hay in September. I may not put them all on the feedlot. I may split them up and graze what can graze and let the rest of them eat hay. Put a group of dry cows on the feedlot, you know, something that don't take much nutrition. And I find that that saves hay because they're going to eat less in September and October. You're feeding them on your feedlot in a dry time of the year. Stockpile your fescue, move them out and graze till the first of the year. Stockpile fescue makes great beef, good eating beef. But I think here's something I'll add to that. Anything that'll make good sweet milk Will make good beef. You want to put the onions in when you cook it. 
Always remember that. You're going to make grass-finished beef. They're eating ryegrass silage in that trough there. My gains usually stay just under three pounds unless the weather gets really cold or really hot. I mean, they gain good, almost as good on the ryegrass silage as they do eating the ryegrass because they don't have to run after it. I'm packing it to them. We put it up in a bunker. Uh, you know, we talk about trying to let the cow harvest all that the cow can harvest, but I'm a tobacco farmer. I've got fields that have exponential amounts of residual fertilizer when we take the tobacco off. You sow that field in about 35 pounds of the acre of Marshall ryegrass, and it will make more forage than you can cure for hay. So... I chop it. I don't have to worry about curing it. Put it up in my bunker, cover it up, feed it in the wintertime. And I get to use up all that ex extra fertilizer. Oh, that's a video. Y'all get to see them chomping on it. <laughs> my wife put this PowerPoint together and I looked at it for about five minutes this morning. We didn't get done cutting the back of the last week and I have been really busy. And Y'all are also getting to hear my first attempt at public speaking. I hope you can understand me and I'm doing good enough. But <laughs> and when Chris asked me to do this, I thought I had never done this before. That's a gravel pit. We dug that hill out and made a perfect feedlot. You can scrape it off and keep it dry and they're never in the mud. And, of course, you can see that's not winter. That's probably early fall. But they're enjoying themselves. And every one of them, every one of them calves you see, no worth bull. Put in a spot for her. Grazing efficiency. Now that's summer forage. That's the alfalfa field I was telling you about. Rotational grazing. The first time I ever heard of it, my older brother went to college. I didn't. And he got with a guy named Jim Davis. Anybody know Jim? And Jim was a teaching rotational grazing. And Charles come home talking about it. And I thought, man, that sounds like a good idea because we was already doing a little of that, but we weren't doing it real intensively. And y'all know everybody's farm is unique. Everybody's got a different situation. Everybody's time limitations is unique to you. You know, sometimes of the year, I'll go out there and move a fence twice a day. That, that fence right there, did you see some of my posts that were welded to a disc blade? Just pick them up and move them over. You can run out there with a four-wheeler, and they've got it grazed off pretty good. Move it over three feet. They line up just like he's lining up at a bunk line. And they'll graze every bit of it. It's no wasted forage. They don't tromp it down. They eat it. If they tromp it down, they're not going to gain on you. Oh, that's a video too. I'm just as surprised as y'all are. <laughs> they look like they're enjoying themselves, don't they? Now, uh, when you're doing grass-finished beef, this is a, it's, it's, forage is one thing. But you've got a group of calves here that were all born in the same time period. They've all been managed exactly the same way. Some of them finish in 18 months. Some of them won't finish in 30 months. Why is that? It's genetics. Genetics isn't part of the equation. Genetics is the equation if you want to make money. I mean, why would you want to run an old car that was leaking all the oil out of it? You know, you want to stop up the hole. Genetics is going to stop up that hole. Genetics. I can't say enough about it. Oh, that, that's Hugo. I bought him off of, off of Debbie a few years ago. She hadn't seen him since he left the farm, but right there he is. He's happy. <laughs> and the reason I run a Hereford Bull... And, you know, we hear a lot about Angus genetics, and Angus has got good genetics. If they didn't, they wouldn't have went as far as they've got. But these half Hereford cattle are so easy to work. And when you're going to take cattle to a processing facility, and most of them are mom-and-pop processing facilities, you want cattle that are going to walk in there. They're not going to get excited. They're going to be easy to handle because you don't want one going in there all wall-eyed. He won't be no good. And I've had real good luck using Hereford as my terminal cross and having nice, calm calves that anybody can be around. I think you were around some of my cattle. They, they just don't care who's in the field with them. And uh, that's genetics. And we're always hearing about 
grass-fed beef and somebody eats some of it and says that it's not fit to eat because it ain't fat? What do you think about that? I took a load of calves over here to Hamptons a couple of years ago and had them process them. And the grader was there. And he said, would you like for me to grade these carcasses? I said, I never had any graded. Sure, grade my carcasses for me. If three out of four of them were choice, the other one was select. That's genetics. That one that was select was never going to be choice. And it don't matter what your feed program is. You can only make a choice carcass if he's got the genetics to make a choice carcass. You know, quality is uh, at the processing plant, your processor can make you or break you. If, if you, you've got to know your processor, he needs to know you. And here's my experience with processors, and I've been in most of the plants around here. They don't need you because they're running at capacity. You go in there and you jump up and down and you make demands, you're going to have a hard time getting appointments. You go in there with your hat in your hand and you try to be the kind of customer he wants to work with, you're going to get a lot better quality product. You're going to get appointments more regular. And that's just the way anybody would deal with it if they were in that processor's shoes. We're using Laird's right now at Benton. My wife goes down to the processor every time they cut one of our beef. She vacuum seals it. She's standing right there beside the guy at the saw, making sure everything's done like she wants it done. And what she says is, she sees the other customers come in. And she sees the way he interacts with the ones that come in there with their snotty nose on, you know. And they're just not going to get nothing off of him because he don't need them. He's doing all he can do without them. And there, there's one of our carcasses hanging there in the cut-up room, by the way. Uh, a good butcher can cut the profitability right into your yield. A bad butcher can take it right out. When that piece of meat goes on that saw, it's got to be cut right. If uh, he's a grocery store cutter, he's probably not ever going to make you no money. If your end of your ribeyes is going on the hamburger table because he didn't cut them straight, you know, you think, well, I lost two steaks on that carcass. Actually, you lost four because he didn't cut either, either side right. <clears throat> and you're killing 40 a year. Look, look at how much money you're losing. The price of hamburger versus the price of a ribeye. If I'm going to sell directly to the public, what's my story? What am I selling? Am I going to sell grass-fed? Am I going to sell grain-finished? Am I going to sell pasture-raised? What does all of that mean? And I'm going to take a minute right here to pick on some of the people I've seen trying to deceive the public. A customer comes to me and they say, oh, I bought grass-fed beef from so-and-so. I said, really? If you'll go drive by their place, there's a feeder out there in the pasture. It's pasture-raised. It's not grass-fed. It's not grass-finished. Don't be trying to trick people. Be honest about it and do what you do well. There's a good market for grain-finished beef. There's a lot of people that won't buy grass-fed beef. they got to have a corn-fed steak. I hear it all the time. Most of the time, I'll give them one steak. Another thing I hear a lot is, my doctor recommended that I eat grass-finished beef. And I went down to so-and-so and I bought some and, and we bought and it's still in our freezer and we can't eat it. We want to buy a few steaks from you and try your meat. If you're going to be a competitor, be a good competitor. There's nothing that hurts a market more than somebody not doing a good job in it. Competition is great. If there's a lot of us selling good quality grass-fed meat, we're building a market. People are saying, this is good stuff, and they're going and telling their buddies. They're all not going to come to me, and they're not all going to come to you. But the bigger the overall market is, the more share we got opportunity to get. And when you don't do a good job, you're hurting your neighbor down the road who maybe is doing a good job because that person come, and they got some of yours, and they eat it, and they said, well, we'll never eat grass-fed beef again. I'd rather eat deer. You ever hear that? <laughs> a 
a bead or two. That one didn't. I? That's our farmer's market set up at Murray. We sell at the farmer's market at Murray on Saturday mornings from 7 till noon. That's the only farmer's market we're doing right now. We did the Paducah market for a while, but that didn't work out very well. And the Murray market is great. We do a lot of business at Murray. But the farmer's market only makes about a fifth of what we sell. You got to sell year round if you're going to sell very much stuff, and you got to have a, a plan on how to do that. Uh, the farmer's market helps us have our face in the public. It's like a marketing strategy. We sold beef a long time before we went to the farmer's market. We've only been doing farmer's market for four years now. And we started selling grass-fed beef in 2011. And I didn't finish telling that story on how we got started. It was an accident, I said, man. I got off on something else. We had a group of heifers that we bred, and eight of them were open. And by the time I realized they were open, they were already getting fat. And I told my wife, I said, Stacy, I said, you know, I've been hearing a lot about grass-fed beef. These are grass-fed beefs. Let's just run an ad in the paper and see if we can sell them. Well, do we want to sell quarters and halves, or do we want to sell by the cut? I have sold quarters and halves before, and I never did enjoy it. So I got a hold of Laird's at Benton, and I said, I got these beeves I want to sell. I want to get them inspected. I don't have a label. He said, no problem. We'll just put my label on them. So we killed them, put Laird's label on them, and sold them as fast as he could kill them and cut them up. And that was the last, that year was, 2011 was the last year we sold any commercial calf. Now, I do sell a calf once in a while at the stockyard, one that's maybe got a problem. It's not ever going to make it, you know, good beef. You'll have them once in a while. Or uh, I told somebody a while ago I sold a cow and, and a good, nice, finished heifer. But her screws has all come loose. She's went nuts. And you have that once in a while. You know, you can just, you, know, you can have the best cattle herd in the world. Once in a while you got that anomaly. And you can't take that one with the screws loose in there and let her tear down that guy's facility and get into the kill pen. You know, and besides that, she'll be a dark cutter and won't taste good and there's no reason to go through that ship that one out and get you a better one to kill. So I let them have her down the stockyard and somebody can figure out how to put her screws back in. <laughs> and uh, you want to have a repeat business if you're going to direct market meat. If you go out here and you put on a big promotion and you have a great big flash sale, how many of them is going to be back? Growth is better if it's done Slow and sustainable. You want these people coming back. You want them telling their neighbors that what they're getting is good. You got to have a good product. If your product ain't good, they're going to eat it one time and they're going to be done. People like to feel connected to your farm. I love it when somebody says, now they talk about my wife because she's the one that does the selling. They say, Stacy Palmer is our farmer. I've heard that. Stacy Palmer is our farmer. They're connected to your farm. They got to feel appreciated. If you go to a farmer's market, and you get your booth all set up, and you got the prettiest booth out there, and you sit down in a chair and you get your iPhone out, and everybody that walks by, you're playing on your iPhone, texting your girlfriend or whatever it is you're doing, you're not going to sell nothing. You got to be on your feet at eye level with a smile on. My wife says her face gets tired of smiling. When she gets home with me, the smile's gone. <laughs> Those are some of the comments. She, she just put that up there and that we, we get on our Facebook page. I think that's the last slide that I had, and I think I've covered everything I aim to cover. Y'all got any questions? At least 14 days. How long to hang your beef? And, and I, a minimum of 14 days. We don't cut anything that hadn't hung 14 days. Sometimes beef will hang 20 days, 21 days. You can hang a beef a lot longer than that, but you're going to get a flavor in your hamburger. It's not going to be bad, but it's going to have a little stronger flavor. And you will lose yield. You know, if you hang it longer than that. But 14 days make a good steak. And if you buy steaks from uh, somebody like me and you ask me how long that beef is hung and I say 14 days, you can take that steak home and age it in the refrigerator. I tell people that. You know, age it for a week in the refrigerator and then cook it.
our animals are usually finished 24 months. Sometimes there'll be, fin be some finished at 18 months. Uh, you've got to learn how to grade that carcass. Beef finishes top to bottom, front to back. There's a point there where you're wasting grass. If you're finishing very many, you're going to waste some feed because you can't get butcher appointments or have enough freezer room or whatever the issue is to get them off of there. That's why I broke my breeding seasons up into four seasons because I had two. Well, I had beefs going 28, 29, and 30 months, and, you know, they were finished at 24 months. Well, everything they ate from 24 to 30 was wasted grass. It didn't make me anything. And it might have made that choice carcass just a little bit better, but it's not enough better to make you any money. So it's, it's, it's a juggle in that, but you've got to learn how to, and another thing you've got to learn to do as far as looking at cattle and figuring out how good that beef is on the hoof is how am I going to ask the butcher to cut this carcass? If it's a really good one, you know, you're going to save everything you can in cuts to sell as cuts. But you're going to have that one that is not going to be a really good one. So how am I going to sell that one? Well, I'm going to take him, turn him into snack sticks and summer sausage. Or I'm going to make hamburger patties out of him. Or my call cows. You know, I've got people that are on a waiting list because they're waiting for me to kill a call cow so they can get some whole cow hamburger. And, you know, every time we kill a call cow and we make whole cow hamburger, we call them up. But... We do sell a lot of snack sticks and summer sausage, and the more of that stuff we sell, the less whole cow hamburger we're going to have available because the objective here ultimately is to make money. But it's going to bite you in the butt. You can't get you you can't get the quality on grass. You might be able to fatten one if you're pouring the corn to him in that period of time. I don't know, but you just can't get the quality on grass. And you got to have quality. Any more questions? Yes. I don't remember what variety it was, but I specifically planted uh, a grazing alfalfa. Yes. You, the only thing you got to be careful of is bloat. Don't graze it when it's wet. That's, that's why we had a we had a field of sedan grass right beside it. Graze alfalfa when it's dry, pull them off, put them on the sedan grass. Excuse me? Yes, pre-flower. Mm -hmm. Usually it never got to flower. If it starts flowering and I'm not keeping up with it, I mow it for hay because that's your best quality forage. My summer forage program, of course, I told you I've used sedan grass. I am changing to crabgrass, thanks to Chris. He talked me into it. <laughs> I'm using Red River crabgrass. You know, I've already established that I'm a tobacco farmer, and I've got land that we're using for tobacco. We run ryegrass and crabgrass in rotation. Uh, you know, the ryegrass is your, your winter annual. When ryegrass is... Finishing in May, your crabgrass is coming right behind it. Uh, most of my ground that we raise tobacco on and are also using for forage production, I said it's irrigatable, and if I need to and, and I got time not watering tobacco, I'll water it and, and keep it actively growing. Uh, the crabgrass is just like the alfalfa in that when it gets so mature, you mow it for hay and get that fresh growth back on it so that you keep your quality up. Uh, I'm going to say this, a lot of what I do is useless to a cow-calf guy because he don't need as high quality feed as I do. Uh, anything else? I'm still learning. Uh, think about any time you're establishing a stand of anything, think about how it's established naturally. I'm going to sow my crabgrass this year in November. You got crabgrass out here on the ground, it makes seed. When's that crabgrass seed going to hit the ground? 
going to hit the ground in November, late fall. Frost comes along, dries it up, crabgrass lays there all winter. I've already got ryegrass on that ground. I'm just going to go in there and intercede it. Crabgrass is going to be there. Right. And we're not doing much in November, so it's a good time to sow crabgrass. Debbie? Uh, you can't hardly work the ground and sow it because you'll get it too deep. Unless you grow tobacco. Well, you're right, but on those particular paddocks, I, I, it never gets to go to seed during the tobacco year. So I'll reseed to build the stock back up. Go ahead. You can do that, and it works real well. Or I got a little four wheeler seeder that's got a small gate, and you can set it and sow it with a four wheeler. If, if you're going to be putting down fertilizer in the fall, you can put your crabgrass seed in the fertilizer. But make sure you double spread it. And if it's a 90 foot, triple spread it. They've got more experience with crabgrass than I have. I've just decided I like it. <laughs> now, my brother runs a uh, small dairy, a cow share dairy, and he's right next to my farm, and he was grazing crabgrass back in May and June, and the cows were running the cans over. I mean, the quality is excellent. And I don't know how you could beat it. You can't beat it with sedan grass. And it's easier to grow than sedan grass. You don't have the toxicity issue with it. That's right. Is that it? And anybody that wants to come out to my place is welcome. Just contact me. I'll sit down and talk with any of you, help you any way that I can.